as is uh, indicated there, my name is Kevin. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, I work on Fedora infrastructure. So this talk is going to be about our uh, new CommuniShift instance, which I'm going to talk about uh, how it's set up, how you can use it, uh, what it consists of, uh, how we expect it to be used, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I thought I'd give a little brief history uh, of the, the kind of things that we were, uh, that this is replacing, essentially. We have right now a, a private cloud instance that's running OpenStack 5, 5.0, if anyone remembers that long ago. <laughs> um, and it's, of course, having lots of problems because it's so ancient. And uh, we have a number of instances there that are uh, community-oriented things. We have uh, maintainer test machines. Uh, Coper runs some of its uh, stuff there. We have um, uh, just a lot of development instances for our application developers. And we, we kind of envisioned that cloud network as being a place where people could spin up things, experiment, figure out how their, their applications were working, uh, you know, test things, get things to a state where they wanted to have wider usage, things like that. And it wasn't really that successful. And I think um, we've learned a lot of lessons from that. And uh, hopefully this, uh, this replacement will, uh, will be much more effective. Hello. Ah, my presentation console is out of sync. So uh, we have this CommuniShift instance. It's a uh, OpenShift uh, 4.1 instance, and uh, it's using a lot of uh, a lot of hardware. So it's got a lot of capacity for things. Um, it is. One of the reasons we went with OpenShift 4 as opposed to OpenShift 3 or, or another OpenStack, something like that, uh, you may have seen some of the other talks uh, at this flock about how the CPE team, which I'm part of, or the Fedora engineering team as we used to be, uh, are overloaded. We have a lot of stuff to do. We don't have that much time. We, uh, we're trying to cut back on the things we're doing. We're trying to focus on the things that will give us the most uh, bang for the buck. So one of the things we really wanted out of this is for it to be very self-service so people were not blocked waiting for us or uh, you know, asking us for things. They could just dive right in and go do what they needed to do without uh, any further uh, interaction. And so OpenShift uh, 4, for those of you who have, who have not used it yet, uh, is very hands-off as far as managing. Uh, if we have time here, I'll, I'll show you because there's an update pending. But basically, when there's up, an update, you just click a button that says, OK, go ahead and update my cluster. It does everything in the background. It moves your pods off of the node. It updates the node. It reboots the node. It makes sure it's working. It moves pods back onto it. It does all of that. And so that's going it, to it does work. It does. It's amazing. <laughs> it is magic. So uh, wh one of the things. Uh, we really wanted was to have something that was low maintenance for us, self-service for the people who are using it, um, and so that people could actually get a lot of use out of it without us having to babysit it. So uh, how many people here know what OpenShift is, have used it? Quite a few people. Good. So I, I won't go too much into this, but if you have never used OpenShift, it's just basically a platform for managing your containers. And you can stuff all kinds of things in containers, as you might imagine. Your application can run in a container. Uh, OpenShift has a, a concept called pods, which is uh, multiple containers that are sort of able to talk to each other and perform different functions. Uh, OpenShift gives you a platform that is opinionated and is the same from a cluster to cluster. You can export from one cluster, import to another cluster. It's the same stuff. Um, and it's, it's really nice because it's, you can get started really quickly. You can have it manage a lot of the heavy lifting stuff that the infrastructure that you would normally have to do yourself if you were, if you were just deploying this to a, a VM or something like that. So it's, it's very handy for this uh, sort of thing. So here, here are the use cases we kind of imagine uh, for this cluster. 
uh, proof of concept applications. So you might have an idea for something and go, hmm, you know, I, I think this is a great idea, but I'd like to make sure it works before I ask people to help me with it, that kind of thing. Um, applications to get your work done more efficiently. Uh, and a good example of this is there's some folks who use, uh, who build modules right now for Koji and do a lot of their work in their own Koji instances that they run elsewhere. Um, this is certainly a place that you could run that and uh, do test module builds, things like that, uh, very easily. Uh, applications supported by uh, the community that we're trying to not support ourselves anymore because we're trying to focus on things. Uh, this is a great place to have the resources to stand up that application and get a team or a group to work on it and make sure that it, it continues to, uh, to function and uh, provide value to the community. And it's a, a generally a, a nice way to, for people to learn about OpenShift if you don't have experience with it or uh, you want to, to gain experience with it or uh, uh, see how it works. Uh, there's any level of detail you can get to here. Sure, and that's actually something that we've we've had in the past where uh, local communities have come to us and said, you know, oh, we want a website and, a, you know, a place for gathering. And we didn't have any way to do that. You know, we didn't have a general infrastructure for that kind of thing. But, yeah, that's absolutely something that they could run in, in, this, uh, in this instance. Uh, so what do we support in this instance? We support the OpenShift platform, and that's it. <laughs> Um, we want things to be as self-service as possible. Um, there will be outages at downtime, but we will try and keep that to a minimum, as a minimum as possible. Uh, I mentioned upgrades earlier. Uh, OpenShift 4 is, like I said, has been really good at upgrades. Our, uh, our cluster is running uh, Red Hat Core OS as all the nodes. So even the, even the nodes are managed by the cluster manager, by Kubernetes. So it does a really pretty good job about processing through the updates and, and, and just handling that for us. So I don't foresee there being downtime for updates or, or things like that. There might be up, uh, downtime for you know, data center issues or network issues or things like that, but uh, there, there really shouldn't be that much in the way of, of maintenance and whatnot. And so what does that leave for the people running things uh, to support? Well, uh, there's a, a wiki page that I have at the end that has a lot of this uh, mentioned more in more detail, but uh, it's up to you to, to back up your application, which it, when you're using OpenShift, that's pretty easy. You can actually export the, the definition, and if you have a database or something like that, you'll obviously need to back up that database. But it's actually pretty easy to do that kind of thing uh, with OpenShift. Um, we re definitely recommend that you put your uh, management of your application into Git. You can use any Git forge you want, Pagare, GitHub, GitLab, your own personal Git server, whatever you want to use. But if you use Git for your changes to your application, that way you keep track of them, you can roll back easily, other people can contribute, do pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. And OpenShift is really built around that sort of workflow. Uh, your application can build out of your Git repo. You can actually set things up very uh, automatically so you don't actually need to mess with the OpenShift side of things anymore. You know, you just do a commit to your Git repo. It, uh, OpenShift notices that there's a change, rebuilds your source image, rolls out your, uh, your new application, and there it is. And you actually, all, all you had to do was uh, commit that Git uh, commit. Um, another thing that's very important with this setup is your application needs to have a way for people to know who it is that they can contact. If they start using your application and it goes down, we're not going to be able to do anything about that. We need to know who to refer them to. So uh, we would definitely recommend you have some way of uh, referring them to you, email address, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Tim. Yes. Um, and so does that mean we, that if I have an application that is using persistent storage, I have to, I'm responsible for backing up the contents of that persistent storage? 
Uh, yes, so the, the question was, is there persistent storage? And the answer is yes. And the second question was, uh, if you're responsible for backing up that persistent storage? And the answer again is yes. And we do have it, it's an NFS storage, and we do have it set to uh, not reclaim. So like, if you, got, if you accidentally deleted your app or something like that, that storage would still be there for a while until we manually went and reclaimed that drive, that claim. But um, you know, you, you shouldn't count on that. You should actually back up that information. So. so then, are there going to be? Is it something where you know, again, I have my application and it's up there. I need to have my own storage. I need to have my own cron jobs or whatever I do to to back all that stuff up. There's no guarantee that that data will um, survive if there's some if something goes wrong. I'm right. Not expecting it. It's just to right. making sure I understand that it is 100% my responsibility. Correct, and, and the reason we thought about it, you know, providing a, a backup service, or we even thought about providing database services, things like that, but then we get back to us doing a lot of work, and <laughs> we're already overloaded, so it's like, okay, do you want Rawhide Compose to be fixed today, or do you want me to restore the data for this application? So we wanted it to be pretty clear that it's it's up to the user to, to back up that data or not. I mean, if you don't want to back up your data and if you want to reproduce it, if you, it depends on what your data is, I, I suppose. So. Huh. No, it's, it's just NFS right now, although I haven't run into that problem with that, but maybe it's still there. It's, it's, it's clear, but uh, like they, of course, recommend to use profile and set up database, but for custom applications, we don't have that. Usually, it's for small applications. So, Oop. yeah. Uh, Neil. Yeah. Um, so, in my travels, in my <laughs> yeah. one of the things that is probably not great is there isn't good guidance on how to do backups of persistent storage. Would you guys at least be, when you're bringing this all to be available, would you at least provide some guidance on how to do those backups? Yeah, absolutely. We can, we can look into that. I think it depends on what you're storing. I mean, if it's a database, then obviously you just yeah. connect to your database and do a dump. But like a, So in this case, like the application I'm envisioning uses a file system like a database, so it stores a bunch of crap all over it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just know how to do it. Right, absolutely. And uh, yeah, we can look into that and see what the best practice is. I think there may be a way to get it exported or. Right, you, you could maybe do it with another container that does stuff or uh, possibly even just some sort of uh, OCR shell script thing. I don't. I'd have to look, but yeah. you're right, you're right. That's that's a good point. Yeah. So then will we also provide platforms for the backup? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so the question was would would we provide the platform th for the backups? And uh, I don't think we plan to do that now. I mean I guess if there was a great demand we could look into doing that. Well, Correct, yeah, and I was I have a later slide about that, but yeah, one of the other things is we're thinking of this as sort of a an incubator, so like if somebody brings up an app and they get a team and they start making this app great, and you know uh, they uh, it gets used by a lot of people, it becomes central to whatever, and it's it something that is in our mission, so it's like something that, that helps with the build system or something like that, then yeah, absolutely, we could look at at you know promoting it into a different area. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, OpenShift, the question was logging, uh, shared logging, and OpenShift does provide um, 
for itself a uh, elk stack type of thing but that is just for the sort of the infrastructure so it would like log that your pod was crashing or something like that it wouldn't be your application but you can instantiate your own uh, logging stack obviously you would have to store that data somewhere <laughs> Ah, okay. So the question is, is the, is the cluster manager view available? Uh, we haven't talked about that, but I don't see any reason why we wouldn't make that available. I mean, it seems good. Uh, there's a question back there. So, yeah, so I've got a slide on, on quota, actually, <laughs> right, right coming up. So let me, uh, let me get to that. Uh, so this is just briefly talking about access right now or what our plan is is to have a fast operator or an operator that syncs fast groups and we'll just add people to a fast group and then it'll just uh, create your account or give you privileges to self-provision. Uh, right now that is not done yet so uh, I would ask anyone to who wants access let me know send me an email I will write a list and then after Flock, I will sit down and just add everybody, and then you can log in. We're using the Fedora IDP, so it's, it will use your Fedora credentials to log in. And it will, by default, everyone will be a self-managed or a, uh, whatever it's, a app creator or whatever that role is. So you can create your own apps. You can create your, your own pods. Uh, if you need, for some reason, if you want a shared app, if there's some app that you know, multiple people are wanting to work on, you don't want it in a particular, your particular namespace, something like that. Um, just talk to us and we can set that up uh, fairly, fairly easily or move an app after the fact if, if need be. Uh, we're, we're hoping, or I'm hoping to do more widespread access down the road, uh, like Packager or QA or, you know, just open it up to all those groups and just, you know, see what, what people uh, want to use it for. So quotas. Uh, this is kind of the, the lowball quota that we were thinking of, but uh, we can certainly change it. It's five projects, 10 pods, uh, five volumes, something like that. Like I said, we're open to changing this. It just depends on how many people are interested, what kind of apps people are doing, that kind of stuff. Um, we could also either look at bumping this totally or on demand. Pierre. Just uh, curiosity, uh, my project 10 pods, is, that, is there a restriction on the number of pods per project? Or can, I have, can I have one project with nine pods and one project with one pod? Right, it's multi-project. It's multi These are multi-project quotas, so, yeah. 10 pods per project? No, it's 10 pods total, yeah. Yeah, uh, you, we could <laughs> we could put those restrictions in place, but I was just going to start out at least not doing that and just you know if somebody we reserve the right if you're disrupting things to destroy your app, but uh, hopefully people are are good about that and just you know use as much resources as they actually need. Uh, also, I think that a lot of the well. The CPU and uh, some of the other resources are are kind of strange in OpenShift to deal with anyway. So, so the future. <laughs> uh, I've actually got a, a Kubevert uh, CNV 2.0 installed, and I've been playing around with it. Uh, for those not familiar, Kubevert is a way to use OpenShift to manage VMs instead of containers. Uh, unfortunately, I hit a bug in 2.0 that makes it not very uh, useful for anyone. So I'm hoping there's a, a bug fix release out soon that will fix that. As soon as uh, that's useful enough to where we can, we can use it, I'm gonna try and move all the stuff from our old cloud off so that we can decommission it. Um, 
And most of those things don't need a whole lot. They need, you know, SSH access or at, uh, web access, things like that. Um, so as soon as they fix the, the masquerade issue that I hit, um, hopefully we can move those. Yeah, Neil. Um, with the Hubert based provisioning, is there a possibility for um, uh, restricted nested virtualization of any kind or no? Uh, I don't know if it does nested or not, but basically what it does is it uh, creates a, a pod that runs libvirt and runs your VM with the definition that you gave it. So it may be possible to just to define that in the in the config. I don't know. I, I didn't know the yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Right. I, I think the only thing that prevents that is you may need to get permissions to the KBM device yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Like yeah. That. yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. The, one of the applications I have in mind for playing around with would having nested virtualization make it easier for doing some of the test kind of things. Not necessarily heavy load VMs, but VMs and VMs. Right. Right. And it's uh, the VM stuff is is very flexible too. There's different sizes, and you can you can pick your image, and you can say what the storage is that you want associated with it, and blah blah blah. You can use cloud in it. Etc. If if you really want, uh, wide availability. As I was saying earlier, I hope to open this to like some general Fedora groups so we can get people just testing it out and and playing with their apps. Uh, so this is something that we have discussed, but we never came to a conclusion on, and we probably need to figure out. Um, it's been suggested that we we have some kind of heartbeat or. Uh, periodic check type thing so that uh, we know, you know, if you start an app and you run it and then you leave, <laughs> that this app is, you know, not really maintained anymore, nobody's using it, et cetera, et cetera. But it's kind of difficult to know what the best way to do this is. So if anyone has suggestions on, on how we should do this, we're all ears. So. Yeah, that's just piggybacking on what she said, like uh, the usual approach to use is you know that manager will define a different glitch so somebody has to press it like every thirty days or something like that. And if it does it's, oh, yeah, it's something it's a critical situation. Right. For for the recording the, the suggestion is that we leverage the alert manager built into OpenShift to uh, require app owners to do something or prove that they still exist periodically. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's Yeah, I mean, we, we thought about uh, looking to see if it had any traffic or, you know, uh, mailing the app owner. But again, we want to avoid any kind of like manual stuff. I don't want to, oh, it's six months. I've got to go through these 50 apps and mail these people. No, no, <laughs> bad. Here. Uh, oh, shoot. Well, the the uh, the uh, kind of the top level requirement there is that it's Fedora related, so uh, people should not run their personal email server, no crypto mining, no you know none of that stuff. So. No. All right. So uh, here's some links. Uh, there's our wiki page with more information. Uh, we also have a Hackfest Sunday morning. 
So if you want to catch me and ask me questions about it or say that you're interested and want to log in, um, just you can definitely find me there. And if you have any ideas or feedback or whatever, uh, the Fedora Infra list would be the best place or tickets if there's, there's something you want to change. Yes. Yes, actually, that's a good point. Uh, we we have uh, set up the um, so OpenShift four has operators that can do all kinds of fun things, and we've uh, we've set up a uh, SSL cert operator. So it's actually got Let's Encrypt certs for all of its stuff, and any application that wants to be under that domain, you know, apps dot os dot fedora for cloud, whatever, will just be under those those certs. If you're doing a VM or you're doing something with an external IP or something like that, you can actually call that operator in your app. You could say, hey, I want a TLS cert for this route, and it will, it'll handle it. It'll get the cert, renew it, keep, make sure everything's great. So yeah, operators are, are awesome. Right, right now it's a flat domain, so it's, it's uh, the typical, or the top part of it is os.fedoraandforcloud.org, and so there's apps and then username and projects uh, on top of that. So it is kind of gets kind of unwieldy, but if there's a demand for different domains, we could look at that. But I don't know if that matters that much. <laughs> but uh, there are there are external IPs that will probably be get get used with the VMs. So we could put things that want other uh, other domains on some other external IP and do a different. Well, for example, for community sites, we would use the redirect key prior to either a community for, site or uh, the name. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And if there was like, say, there's a popular app that a lot of people use, might want a different, uh, easier to use URL. But yeah. So actually we have three clusters because we have a staging <laughs> cluster, a production cluster, and then this cluster. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it depends really our, our staging and our production clusters we're keeping for things that we're actually maintaining as a team, the infrastructure team, and the community one is for things that, so it, it's a matter of who's maintaining it or who's, who's the upstream for it or who, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, if, yeah, it's very easy to move, it would be very easy to move stuff through, especially if it's stateless. Right, right. And, and like I said at the beginning, I mean, our, our vision for this is that it, it pretty much self-manages itself and barring, you know, some sort of hardware catastrophe, it's just going to run. We're not going to, it doesn't need updates. It doesn't need, or it updates itself. So, yeah. I am, a, I am lying with that. Yes, it does need updates, but. So yeah, it's running 418 right now. And actually, do we have a little time left? Maybe a minute or two? Uh, 419 is out and it's pending. So I could click the little button that says update cluster if you want. I mean. <laughs> yeah, which of course it will since I'm It's really yeah. hard. <laughs> I mean, it will obviously go better than how my demo went. So. <laughs> well, I don't test market. 
Uh, the network might be not too great here, though. Saved, saved by DNS. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> it just... See there, cluster update is available. Update now. <laughs> it's not done yet. <laughs> so you can see it, it says working toward. So as part of this update, it like updates the core, uh, Red Hat Core OS on all of the nodes, reboots them all, and uh, updates all the containers of all of the stuff that is the cluster. So it like pulls the new containers, does stuff, reboots it, makes sure that comes back up, does the next one, et cetera, et cetera. Right, it evacuates all the pods off of the nodes as it reboots them and moves them back, just in the background. <laughs> Right. So, so the question is, uh, do we have any particular way of deploying the production OpenShift stuff uh, so that you can look to doing that later in the in the future? Uh, yeah, we do, and it's really opinionated. So, it, it is all in Ansible. It's in our Ansible repo. You can look at it. The way it works is, it does everything in Ansible. So, Ansible is responsible for creating all the the project, all the objects, everything. Uh, so if the cluster burned to the ground tomorrow, we could run Ansible the, and the app would be redeployed if it did not have any persistent data. We we don't store YAML files. Uh, we use Ansible to to make the individual objects. So if you look, it's it's not the it's not the YAML. It's like the describes how the YAML should be. I guess I don't know way, how to describe that. But you can look at examples on our uh, on our Ansible repo. Those are not, but those are not the raw. If you dump that out of OpenShift, that's not what you would get. You you wouldn't get, you know, Ansible roll this with this. Yeah. Right. 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 On our production cluster, that's not true. Uh, app owners have only permission to their app, and Ansible runs the playbooks and everything. They do not have, for this one, yes, absolutely. You, you can use OC, you can define your app, whatever you want to do there. But again, it's up to you to back up that application or manage it however you want to manage it. You know, I'm, I would suggest to get repo and, you know, have some, some management there, but if that's not what you want to do, that's fine. But, you know, if something happens, <laughs> then you'll have to recreate it. Right. Yeah. To learn how it works. Cool. Yeah. So do we have the, the internal registry for this open system stands to be accessible? Like, can I just log into the registry and then get my application container image out of from this whatever? Yeah, I, I believe the registry should be available. Yeah. So again, the, the thought here is also that anything in here is open source. You should not never put anything in this that is not. <laughs> uh, what is that? 18% complete. Wow. So uh, if you want to look at more detail, you can look at the cluster operators here and it'll actually show you eventually <laughs> It, it takes like 20 minutes or something, uh, usually. Uh, three masters and eight workers, eight nodes. Yeah. And you're doing like single rollout, like training one, dating, and the other. Right, yeah, it does them, I think, one at a time. So you can see what, what things are 
RRD419, and it shows you that it's updating these things. So progressing three nodes at revision, and it's updating all the time. So it's pretty cool, and it's pretty nice that I don't have to do anything. Our production <laughs> cluster is, is OpenShift 3, and there you have to, and they're uh, RHEL nodes, not CoreOS. So you have to evacuate them, update them, reboot them, run Ansible, uh, OpenShift Ansible, da 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 da. Which kind of infrastructure is underlying the cluster? It's actually a Dell. Uh, well, it's two Dell uh, FX boxes. They're a blade type system. It's so just... So it's in the data center then? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's in our cloud network, though, the same network that our, our private cloud is in, which is completely separated from anything else there. It, it's, like, directly connected to the outside. So that section of the network could not conceivably... It's physically impossible for that network to get back into the inside, which also means if you need resources from, from Fedora Project, your requests go out and then back in and <laughs> use the public IP space. So there's no, there's no like back entrance to like Koji packages or anything there. But you can go around to the public IP and, and access that stuff. So, yeah. Oh. Yeah, let's uh, wrap this up. Any other questions? All right.